All right, I'm just on the hunt for some 470 mic 16 volt caps to do a little redneck repair on an LCD monitor over there. And I thought I'd part out this Silicon Graphics Indie System computer monitor. It's been sitting outside for quite a while, covered in dirt, and the previous owner didn't exactly handle it properly. It's been put down so hard it's punched the base up into the plastic cabinet and wrecked it. So, first of all I'm going to plug it in and see what it does. And second of all, we're going to pull this thing apart and just see what's inside. These are actually made by Sony in Japan. It's a Trinitron tube. That nice front, flat curved front. Very uh, noticeable compared with normal CRTs. Stop buzzing you bloody fly. It's gone through the bug zapper and hasn't died yet. Acid. Yeah, the oh, plastic base is busted. It's actually pushed it up in the back there too. It's all cracked. So, uh, yeah. Pull this thing to bits. Alright, this is what I like about old Japanese equipment. This was made in 1994. And this is why it's so damn hard to carry. Because it's covered in sheet metal, RFI and electrostatic shielding as well as grounding sheets and things. All this has a purpose. It's not just so that it's more rigid. It's actually shielding it against external interference. It's preventing other things around it from being interfered with. And it's also shielding against electrostatic discharge. That bit there is plastic. It's covering the anode for the tube. Um, most of this is aluminum. It's heavy, but still light. That's all steel, all around the back of the tube. Uh, yeah, it might take a little while to get this shielding off, but I'll start undoing some screws and put this camera back on charge. Alright, before I get too carried away stripping this down, let's power it up. That's what I was originally going to do before the camera died. Awful lot of components in these. It's not a bad thing though, I'm pretty sure I'll find the caps that I need inside it, but let's just see what it does first. Mains on. Yeah. In standby. Yeah, it probably won't do anything because it doesn't have a signal. That's the problem. It's got a weird connector on it and I don't have the computer to plug into it anymore. does sort of work. There's no glow from the electron gun, but that's because it's not on yet. Oh well. Trinitron tubes only have one electron gun, by the way. They're a colour tube, but unlike normal CRTs, they have a vertical wire aperture grill and a differently arranged pattern of phosphor on the front glass. When I bust this tube open eventually, I'll show you what I mean. There's a big difference between a Trinitron tube and a normal, regular cap cathode ray tube, an aperture grill type tube. These ones use vertical wires. Okay, these sets don't have a normal neck board like a uh, regular computer monitor as well. This one's held on with a clamp as a part of a neck ring assembly. It's got two neck rings on it as well as an electromagnetic coil to manipulate the electron gun. Three colour wires, red, green and blue, feeding into the drivers. They are not optic fibre, they're coax. Yeah, they're coaxial, they're not optic fibres. So you've got coaxials going red, black, red, green and blue, coming off the driver board in here. Now uh, that's coming off the input too. It's got a weird looking input socket on it, which is, I think it's unique to the uh, IRIX silicon graphics system. So we'll pull that apart later. This is the high tension board. You've got the focus and high tension pots. Main flyback. That lead goes to the transformer. 
that board there has tons of surface mount caps and things on it. Really complicated little unit. And that's the main power supply under that shield there. That I don't know about. It's a big STK pack. It's an STK 390-120. I'm sure someone will look that up on the net and tell me what it is. And you can clearly see there is only one gun inside that neck. That's what a that's what makes a Trinitron tube unique along with the shadow mask. Which again is vertical wires rather than a perforated screen. Yoke's rather rather complicated as well. There's some field coils out here. There's coils inside there. There's a coil around the outside, which I've seen on regular monitors, and then there's the regular coils underneath. I suppose it's like an X and Y axis, horizontal scan and vertical scan. And that just tells the, uh, or arranges the beam scan coming off the gun in a certain pattern to create your image. Well, I think it scans horizontally from the bottom up or something like that. It's been ages since I studied exactly how a CRT works. But everything's about LCDs now, so there's no point in keeping this thing in one piece. Oh. Keep stripping this thing down. Okay, we're getting into the cathode ray tube assembly now. We have two separate degaussing coils. These are responsible for stabilizing or eliminating any latent magnetic fields inside the tube. Uh, anyone who's put a fixed magnet near a CRT would know what it does. It create disturbs the electron beams and makes really funny colors. It can be a bit of fun too if you've got a junk television. Turn it on, tune it into a station, or put an image on it, and then just wave a strong magnet near it and get some really crazy colours. And that's essentially what the yoke's doing. The yoke is an electromagnetic coil, and that's why an electro or a fixed magnet interferes with it. Um, magnets interfere with the beams or move the electron beams around inside the tube, and the yoke's designed to direct the beams in such a pattern in such a way that it creates a proper image on the front of the screen. And fixed magnetic fields or latent fields cause interference, causing distortion or miscolored patches. Likewise, if a set's been dropped and the aperture grill has moved inside the tube, it may also have a uh, miscolored patch or similar sort of effect which is not fixable because the aperture grill is distorted or moved. I've only seen that once and the set was dropped from quite a height, but it still kept working. It didn't break anything on the board, we never had to resolder anything, but the colours wouldn't come good. And we determined that the uh, aperture, aperture grill shifted inside the tube. So, that's what these coils do, they just fix up latent fields. That's your earthing braid which stretches over the back of the tube. Always discharge your tube before you start handling it, I've already done that. Um, that's what if you've got a discharge lead, which is just a multimeter lead with an alligator clip on the end, clip it onto this braid and then stuff it under the anode cap, which is that bit there. Jam the end of the probe under that while it's attached to that, and you'll generally discharge it. Try not to touch that while you're discharging it. I've done that before, and you get a partial zap. It's enough to wake you up, but not enough to kill you. So yeah, that's that assembly got a grounding wire on it. Not anymore. That's the front panel. Nothing too special. A little IC controller and other shit in there. And that's the yoke. It's a rather interesting looking yoke too. Not like your normal CRTs. I'll put that aside and we'll play with that later. And that is the tube. It is a 20 inch CRT tube. Fairly big and very heavy. We'll have some fun with that later. Maybe cut the band off it and throw a flywheel at it. That sounds like fun. And that's just the front cover, or the front control panel. This one here has an a infrared remote to control all the functions. That's its little pickup sensor there. So your front panel buttons are very minimal, but it's got this little remote which slots in like so. Kind of neat. I had a full system for this, the whole indie silicon graphics system with IRIX on it, and I sold that to Matty VT93. He's still got it, and 
I'll hang on to some of the bits of this monitor just in case he wants them. I think the one I gave him displays a very purple image until it warms up. Pretty sure that's a dry solder joint on the colour drive board, but who knows. I'll hang on to the colour drive board from this one just in case he wants to swap it out. But there's nothing too special on that. A tricolour LED, that's about all. Alright, let's look at the main boards. Alright, well that's the main input connection there. I think you've got three colours, red, green and blue, plus some data inputs. There's a little, uh, looks like an SVGA, or sorry, um, S-Video, Super Video Input, but it's actually a slightly modified version of that, called a service port. And obviously there's a diagnostic tool for this particular monitor that you can plug in. Uh, exhibits the same sort of problems as Sony equipment of this age, lots of dry solder joints. These old Sony's are notorious for bad solder joints. I remember working in an electronics store doing my uh, work experience. We actually had one left on our doorstep overnight. It came to work and it was just sitting there. Don't know where it came from, but it was full of dry solder joints. It was just displaying a red picture. It displayed a perfect picture, but it was red. Resolded it, came good. And that was our store security or video camera monitor for the last, well, pretty much until the store shut down. Uh, we just used it as a, we set up a camera out the front so that we could tell when people walked into the store or when we had customers and yeah we used that monitor ever since. There's nothing wrong with it after we resoldered it. Don't know who gave it to us but thanks to whoever gave it to us. Yeah that's a serious looking uh, neck board. Really serious. I'll put that with the yoke. I'm going to run out of time on this video. You can stay with that. We'll crack that one open, and that's the main high tension monitor drive board. Lots of parts. I can't zoom on this camera yet. I still got to go shopping for a decent camera. But yeah, lots of parts. I think I'll find some capacitors for my LCD on that one. And that's the standard switching power supply for it. It'll be multi voltage output, probably five and twelve volts, maybe even higher. I've already spotted some caps which I can use. 470 mic 25 volt caps. Uh, when you're replacing caps on electronics you can go higher voltage but don't change the uh, microfarad reading. Strange things happen if you actually change the number of microfarads. But voltage you can go higher, not lower. Not too high, like not a 125 volt cap in place of a 25 volt one, that's not really good. But say a 25 volt cap in place of a 20 a 16 volt cap is perfectly acceptable. Hell, it'll, it'll last longer. Most caps are slightly underrated for what they're fitted to and they tend to fail as a result of that. But that's just a standard switching power supply. Big enough and heavy enough for an LCD television or even a plasma. It's a pretty decent supply. All Japanese components, Elna caps, uh, Rubicon caps, uh, DEC relays, YEC transformers. It's a bit of Taiwanese stuff, but 99% of it looks to be Japanese. Not bad. It's still working. The monitor initially kicked in. You hear the tube power up and then it went into the standby. So, there's some good caps. Let's get this LCD finished off and we'll go from there. That's pretty much the uh, autopsy on this monitor, and that's all I've got time for, so thanks for watching.